we're going to get a presentation from Michael Schultz. Um, Michael, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but Michael is working on the EMU 68. Yeah, exactly. Being used in the Pi Storm. Um, I got to say, I saw the Pi Storm 30, uh, 32. I saw the on the page. Uh, I don't know if you're affiliated with that or not, but uh, that would be the Pi Storm in an Amiga 1200, and I am absolutely drooling for that technology. So, can't wait to see that be available. Well, with this one, the, cl uh, the cloud is working on that, and I guess uh, it will be ready pretty soon. But uh, let him just first finish it. Oh, yeah. I mean, right now I'm working on Amiga 500 with uh, classic Pi Storm, and yeah. And this is the, the one which I'm using right now. Um, I guess you have to enable me to share the screen. Let me uh, check the zoom controls. I don't think I had the security settings, but let me turn them all off. Um, oh, you know what? I do have to push the button. There you go. Give it a try. All right. Yeah. It seems to work not right now. Okay. Um, can you see it? Can you see the screen? That's perfect here. Okay, great. Uh, we have some delay on YouTube, so I don't see myself with the presentation. Um, yeah, all right. So let's just start. Okay, so, uh, hello guys. Um, hello everyone. It's nice to be on AmiWest, even if not in person, but virtually it's perfectly great to be with you there. Um, all right, uh, let me talk today about uh, MO68, which is a bar metal uh, just in time virtual machine. Um, my talk will be split into a few parts, and uh, I'm pretty happy that I have some more time because uh, uh, actually I wanted to keep myself as short as possible, and uh, probably I will not manage it. Um, so uh, first, I will give you some uh, some project uh, project goals and a short introduction uh, introduction to MO68. And um, after that, a little bit of performance tests, a uh, few words about M68 with PyStorm. Um, yeah, and finally, I will say thank you for everyone. Um, let's start with motivation. Um, so why and what for? I mean, uh, you have plenty of uh, M60K emulators uh, all around the world, and why yet another one? Um, so it started as an extension to a big Endian ARM version of Aros because I wanted to integrate the um, M60K application support and I was looking for uh, any emulators which are available on the market and the problem was um, either they, w they had a uh, wrong license for Aros because we are using the uh, MPL uh, version 1 derivative, uh, so Aros public license and most of them were GPL, which is not compatible, unfortunately. Um, other emulators were available, but with great accuracy and slow, which was not what I was going to have. And at the end, I have found few uh, just-in-time emulators, which are pretty fast, but yet again, wrong license. Um, yeah, and finally, um, the most important reason is uh, can I write a just-in-time emulator? Because it was the first time I have ever tried something like that. And yeah, I guess it seems I can indeed, <laughs> which is pretty nice. Um, okay, so uh, some project goals. Um, it's a just-in-time translator of M uh, M60K instruction stream into ARM instruction stream. Um, the target is, or my goal is, the fastest possible code execution, uh, so there is no focus on specific uh, Motorola model. Um, and what is also important, or what was important for me, was to use um, ARM processor running in big Endian mode, uh, so that we have as little additional code, for example, for swapping, swapping bytes and so on as possible. Um, it should also operate in bar metal. Um, it should have direct access to any hardware which is uh, exposed by the host processor. And finally, it should have ability to start Aeros or Amiga OS. Um, before I go to the next slide, uh, let me just remind you, there was a project, uh, the Emitlon, uh, which was more or less uh, exactly the same goal. I mean, it was just a very, very tiny uh, portion of code for uh, 
x86 processors uh, with uh, Linux on board and uh, executing Amiga OS. Um, MO68 is more or less the same, but I would say it's the same, but it's more. Because in my case, we have barometer operation, no Linux un uh, underneath and so on. All right, so let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, why? <laughs> Yet again, the same question. So let me have a uh, let me have show you what we have. Uh, so in the very beginning, we had uh, Amiga OS uh, M60K executable files, uh, which then extended at some point as we have started to play with PowerPC processors. So we had finally extended uh, Hunk format for PowerPC processors. Uh, then we had the support for ELF files for Amiga OS 3.x. Uh, again, for PowerPC processors, then there came AROS and Amiga OS 4 and Morphos, um, where yet again we have another bunch of executable formats for uh, more or less the very same operating system, but uh, somehow different. Um, the situation with AROS is a little bit more complex because uh, AROS aims to be so, uh, source code uh, portable between the systems, but for example, you cannot run x68 AROS file with, uh, for example, ARM version of AROS and so on and so forth. And finally, we have some new operating systems which are defying everything beyond our uh, 32 bits zoo, I would say. Uh, so we have AROS, which has uh, uh, 64 bit support for Intel processors. Uh, then we will eventually have at some point uh, Morpheus uh, with uh, Intel processor 64-bit uh, support. Uh, we could have also uh, ARM version of AROS for 64 bits and so on and so forth. So I, as you can see, we have a pretty large zoo of different executable uh, for, uh, files or formats for Amiga. And I would propose at this point to say that M60K, at least in, uh, in 32 bits, is our intermediate language. Uh, does it sound somehow familiar? Yes, of course. Uh, it's the very same what .NET does or Java, for example. Looks more or less the same for me. Um, so let me start with MO68. Um, first, a little bit of basics. Uh, so what we have, we have uh, interpreters uh, like, for example, Musashi emulator, which is used in Python right now. It operates more or less like a regular CPU. So it analyzes instruction stream in sequence. It processes every single opcode during reading, uh, executes it. It's adjusts the state machine of the processor. It's very, very perfect system, for example, for cycle exact uh, processor emulation, um, because you can add some delays if you need them at any point. And yeah, it's perfect. It's very precise, but it's not, not really fast. Um, then we have a uh, pseudo uh, just-in-time emulation, for example, like the Buffy project, where you try to overcome the drawbacks of the, uh, of the interpreter because you translate the instruction stream of Motorola processor, for example, to bunch of jumps, to portions of code in the host uh, processor version, which are doing exactly what you are expecting to have. Um, it's much, much faster than interpreter, but it's still not as perfect as it could be. And finally, we have just-in-time emulators. There are a few of them already available, but as I said, uh, with a little bit wrong license for me, uh, they translate entire blocks of code on demand, and they allow to reuse the generated code uh, uh, subsequently. And you have a lot of possibilities to optimize the software or the code in the runtime. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's talk about uh, MO68 in this case. Uh, so as I as I already said, it's a barometer uh, M68 virtual machine. Um, I mean, you can name it emulator, you can name it virtual machine. For me, it's more or less the same. The target is to take an instruction stream of some intermediate format, which, which is M60K in this case, and translate to the native machine. Um, it allows to access the memory of host and peripherals directly. There is no translation layer between them. 
Um, in case of 64 ARM processors, uh, the whole uh, M60K state is held permanently in reg registers of the host. Um, in 60, uh, 64 uh, variant, there is a very strong separation between the host and the virtual machine. The translator is handcrafted, which is a little bit different than in most of the just-in-time emulators which I have seen, um, with very, very strong focus on speed. And um, there are also few on-the-fly optimizations, which I will show you in the next slides. Um, but first, uh, bare metal, is it awesome or is it not? Does it, is it great or does it suck? Uh, I mean, uh, what MO68 has right now is a support for several Raspberry Pi machines, for example, 3A+, 3B+, 4B+, or Raspberry 500, uh, 400. Um, there is some very basic support for Rock Pro 64 and Pinebook uh, Pro. There is basic support for a virtual machine of QAML uh, emulator. Uh, what is great about Barometal is the boot time is very, very fast. I mean, there is no underlying operating system which has to start, which has to be loaded and so on. Um, so the only thing which is executed on the start of the machine is MO68, which means we are immediately in the, in the uh, M60K environment. We have also full control on the hardware, but every single driver which we would need, which we would like to have, we have to write on our own. So uh, direct hardware access, uh, there is a perfect winner, ARM64 version, uh, because the memory access is done without any translation. So we have the very same view of memory area from the 60K environment and from the host perspective. Um, the MU68 engine is inaccessible for uh, M60K code, which means even if our M60K code crash, it will not destroy the M68 directly. We have access to all host peripherals in this case. And as I, as I, uh, as I already said, uh, we keep all uh, M60K registers or few more also in uh, general purpose registers of the ARM processor, and we have also 12 temporal registers for use of the emulator. Uh, the main execution loop is written in assembly language in order to uh, make it as fast as possible. And uh, let's have a look at the memory layout of M uh, MO68 on 64-bit uh, ARM architecture. So the very first press space are the system memory, uh, followed by the video core 4, uh, video memory, and finally I have put all the peripherals uh, or uh, MMIO registers of peripherals to the very top uh, part of the address space of the four gigabytes. This four, uh, this four gigabytes area is repeated uh, immediately uh, after the first one and at the very top of the address space. Um, this is a special trick because uh, in the case of some of the Motorola instructions, we are using, for example, I undirect addressing mode where we add uh, one register value to another register value to look for the memory which is resulting from adding both of them. And in such cases, uh, either I have to make sure that the result of addition does not exceed four gigabyte barrier, or I just may repeat the memory area in these two regions and I don't have any issue with that. As you may see here, uh, the MO68 is very, very, very far away from the, from the M60K accessible range. It's the most at the top of the memory. We have also here a 320 uh, gigabyte shadow um, area of the start of the address space. Uh, finally, we have a just-in-time cache, uh, in my case, 64 megabyte. Uh, separated in two parts. The one of them is readable and the other one is read only, but also executable. Um, yeah, so how does uh, the main exec execution loop look like? Um, we are taking the entry point for M60K, uh, which is the value of the program counter. Uh, from this value, a hash key is generated um, based on that cache, uh, on that hash value. 
we are looking for the available bucket in the uh, in the hash table, which is pretty large in my case. If the bucket is not found, the code will be translated, and if the bucket is found, uh, it is stored somewhere in the double linked list uh, linked list of the of the portions or of the just in time units, as I call them, and it will be then executed. Um, yeah. Um, additionally, uh, this all translated units are stored in another list, which is the last recently used list, uh, which is used in case of uh, shortage of the memory for the just-in-time translation units. If you will need some mem memory, the least uh, or the uh, the farthest in the history, the uh, bucket will be uh, removed. All right. Um, so, optimizations. Uh, what is so great about M68 and what is so different uh, or what is so special? Um, so, I have applied a few mechanisms uh, during translation. One of them is elimination of condition code uh, calculation. The program counter updates are deferred. Uh, there are some code inlining and return stack optimization applied, also loop unrolling and instruction merging. Um, let's, ha let's have a look at that. So, condition codes. Uh, the M60K is very great about that, but it's also very, very awful about that at the same time. Um, you may love it or you may hate it, but nearly every single M60K instruction is somehow modifying the condition code register. So it's uh, accessing or it's changing at least one of the values of the, of the condition codes. Um, but on the other hand, only very few of codes depend on the subset of this condition codes. Uh, as a result, if I would apply calculations of code condition code after every, uh, every single instruction, there would be a lot of unnecessary calculations in the code which are just pretty useless. Uh, let's have a look at this small example of uh, Motorola code. So first we apply some AND operation on register. It meets none of the condition codes registers, but it sets four of them. Then we have another instruction. It meets none of the condition code registers. It sets one again, four of them. Then we have bit test instruction, which is setting nothing, but it, set, uh, it's, it meets nothing, but it sets uh, the Z register. Uh, then we have something that is uh, not changing anything. Then we have one instruction which needs only one condition code but sets nothing. Uh, again, addition. And at the end, we have RTR instruction which is popping from the stack the condition code register and destroys everything that was calculated very, very uh, precisely before. So after we apply such elimination, which I have in M68, we see what we have here only. So uh, at some point, we have one instruction that would be this one. Uh, no, none of them, actually. Uh, we would have only bit test instruction, which is setting the Z value. Uh, the Z value is used by the set instruction, and nothing else is calculated because the MO68 knows that RTR instruction will in any way pop the condition codes by itself. So no calculations are applied. Um, the deferred program counter updates means uh, after every single instruction, I would need to update the program counter, uh, which points me to the instruction which I'm translating or which I'm executing. Um, instead of that, I'm keeping the delta value from the program counter, and the updates are done only in the case where the synchronization of any kind is necessary. Um, so as you may see here, uh, we have the program counter the real value, which is changing with every single instruction. And then what M68 is do doing is the program counter first. It kept, it's kept at the one single value with small delta applied. And finally, uh, the illegal instruction is uh, context synchron synchronizing because it will jump to the, uh, to the exception handler. And in this case, the program counter has to be updated properly. Um, so code inlining is another feature which I have applied in AM68. Um, so usually uh, during just-in-time translations, 
um, the translation is stopped on every single branch or jump or anything. But on the other hand, um, if you see here, if we have uh, our code which we are translating and we are looking at small range of inlining where uh, we may apply some merging of the code, if we can compute the target uh, program counter at compilation time of just-in-time emulator, then we may inline this jump. Uh, this is exactly what you see here. So we have the block A, block B, block C of uh, M68 code, um, which are all related to each one within inlining range. And then we have block D, which is outside of this inlining range. Uh, what MO68 generates from that code is a single block, which includes block A, block B, and block C. At every point where the jump would be done, the program counter is adjusted properly. And the second block which will be generated is block D because it was outside of this uh, inlining range. Um, so if we had this inlining, we could also do something really, uh, a little bit different. Um, let me have a chart here. So we have, for example, small block of M68 code where we have a branch which is computable again to some separate uh, subroutine. Um, if we uh, keep the value of the program counter at this point and we store it, for example, in return stack, and if this small code returns pretty, quick, uh, pretty quickly, then we may inline it in the translated block, what you see here. So in this case, we have a very small subroutine uh, which we have inlined into our block. Uh, Again, we are adjusting program counter at two points, and this can give a, a really a huge speed boost. Um, another thing is loop unrolling. So MO68 attempts to align itself on the loop block, and it allows to repeat the loop several times. This uh, the amount of the repetitions is uh, configurable on compilation time of MO68, and then. Um, from such an inner loop in the code, the translated code is the block A repeated several times with program counter adjustments and the inner loop, which is done into this code, which means in this case, the main loop of uh, MO68 is not running at all because this block is repeated by itself several times. Um, in this case, we have uh, exit from this loop either on loop exit condition, as it was in the case of MC, uh, M60K code, or external interrupts or reset signal. Um, so let me talk a little bit about the performance of M68 because this is more uh, probably what you are waiting for. Um, so first, let's have a look at a very nice example. Um, actually, this, uh, this is a real code. Uh, this is not something specially searched for. Uh, what you see here is nearly one-to-one -one translation from uh, from M68 to uh, ARM 64-bit uh, code. Uh, thanks to merges and uh, condition code calculation eliminations, uh, most of translations are pretty short. So you see here, one single M60K instruction is translated to two ARM, process, uh, ARM processor instructions. We have even cases where there is a one-to-one -one translation, which means here, one uh, Motorola instruction results in one ARM instruction. We have also instruction merging. So MO68 in this, in this very case has recognized that these three instructions following each other are just used to reverse the four bytes within the long word, which is just endian conversion. And for that, ARM64 has one single instruction, which means in this case we have merged three M60K instruction into single ARM opcode, which is a very, very nice optimization. Um, finally, we have also some epilogue, uh, which, is ex uh, which is executed at the very, uh, at every exit from the uh, just-in-time execution block, uh, where the conditions codes are eventually stored if they were changed and also some uh, additional performance counters are updated. For example, number of executed M60K instructions. 
Um, we have also a little bit worse cases, for example, this one. Uh, it's not really optimal, as you can see. So one single instruction has resulted in uh, uh, a lot of uh, arm of codes. But this is a very special case, and not really everything from this uh, from this instruction is executed because, uh, as you may see here, we are modifying status register, which is basically only allowed in the supervisor mode. So first, the privilege check is uh, made, and if the code is in supervisor, the uh, status register is updated. Uh, the level mask is updated in the case of this instruction. If necessary, ARM interrupts are uh, enabled or disabled the, depending on the value which we have written here. And if we had user mode, then it has to switch to supervisor, it has to switch the stack frame, it has to generate the privilege violation stack frame, it has to load uh, VBR register, and finally load the address of the interrupt or exception handler to the program counter. So this is what the most of this code is responsible for. So luckily, even if it looks such huge, it's not really a lot which is executed. Um, yeah, synthetic tests. Um, this, uh, what, what I'm showing you here is MO68 running without PyStorm. Um, and as you may see here, uh, I have extracted the performance measurement routine from, uh, from SysInfo and uh, on Raspberry 400, uh, I have more or less uh, nearly 2,000 MIPS uh, performance. And the raw memory uh, speed, uh, speed performance is in the range of nearly four gigabytes per second. Um, you could ask if, it's, if it is due to the caching. Um, in this case, no, because uh, I was reading uh, nearly 250 megabytes of the memory in this test and repeating that uh, for several loops. Uh, so I can assure you that it's not only reading the memory from the cache, it's really reading the memory from the, from the board. And um, if we off Raspberry 400 uh, to 2.1, uh, actually it should be 2.15 gigahertz, uh, then we have a pretty, pretty nice performance boost of the system. So this is the speed of M uh, M60K code executed on this ARM processor. It's not the speed of the ARM itself. Um, it's pretty nice. I mean, it's uh, something uh, we could expect in the future, uh, for example, on uh, PyStorm 32. Um, and just to give you rough information, um, I have written some stress tests for MO68. Uh, one of them is a path tracer. Uh, it, it's adapted small PT project, uh, adapted to borrow middle operation. It's the very same which I was using on AROS when I was testing multi-core support. Um, and it's pretty, pretty astonishing because uh, it's testing a floating point unit very, very intensively. I mean, the most of the code is only FPU. Uh, including uh, sinus cosinus calculations, which I have already implemented. And uh, in this very case, uh, which you may see here on this video, a little bit, for, at least for a very short period of time, uh, MO68 is reaching more or less 30% of native ARM64 performance, which is, I would say, pretty great, uh, because you have to take into account in the case of MO68, we have only eight floating point registers which are available for M60K. Um, the native code has, has much more uh, registers available for all calculations, so it can be just faster. And this is more, uh, probably the limit which we cannot uh, exceed. Uh, but I guess 30% of native performance is already pretty good. Um, so I have also written and uh, applied another test, which is testing not only floating point unit, but also memory. Uh, this is Buddha broad fractal. Um, it takes a little bit time to calculate it uh, to the form which you can see on this image. Uh, please keep in mind, it's, uh, it's not the typical fractal which, may, we, which we may calculate in the fraction of second, because in the typical fractal, uh, what we are displaying on the picture 
this number of steps for every single point which are necessary to escape from the image, to outside of the image. In the case of Buddha Broad, uh, it's not the uh, number of counts which is displayed. Uh, what we are display displaying here is the path of the point which is needed or which is applied during escape. Um, in this case, uh, I have used Raspberry 400 overclocked again to 2.15 gigahertz and the fractal with size of 800 times 800 pixel uh, was rendered within 61 seconds. And just for comparison, uh, the Core i5 at 3.2 uh, gigahertz, uh, it was the machine which I was using at that time, is needing 20, uh, 27 seconds for the same image in the same size. Um, I've been cooperating with Claude uh, for some time already, and we have been discussing the possibility of using MO68 with his project. And finally, we have done it. So for those who don't know, uh, I guess none of you, uh, <laughs> doesn't know about that the PyStorm allows to access uh, Amiga 500 hardware through the CPU bus. Um, right now it's using Musashi interpreter for the processor and Linux for hardware support. Um, and in my case, it's perfect testing environment because uh, I've been already asked why, I am, uh, why am I using my time for PyStorm where some people were expecting that I, was, I would use MU68 for something beyond just Amiga. And I must really say, uh, in case of PyStorm, it's the perfect testing environment for me because uh, what we have there is a large, a large software base, um, which means we have all the Amiga software which we could just have. Um, so because of that, the degree of freedom uh, with respect to potential bugs is highly reduced because imagine what would be if I would be, uh, for example, porting comple something completely new to MO68. In this case, every bug which I could introduce in my code uh, could be just covered by the bug which was in MO68 itself. So it means I would be hunting for much more issues at the same point. And as a reward, a reward for the uh, PyStone project, we what I can give back is, of course, a little, a little speed boost. Um, yeah. So, but on the other hand, MO68 is only the processor. And for the other hand, uh, on PyStorm with Linux, you have also hardware support, which is pretty important in this case. Um, so uh, there I have done something a little bit different. So in my case, in case of MO68, only ROM mapping feature is added to the emulator and Zorro config space is emulated for one single reason. In this case, we uh, can use map ROM to switch to any kickstart image which we'd like to have, kickstart uh, 1.3, 2.0, 3.2, uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, also diachrome, for example, for testing of the system, AROS or something, uh, something different, whatever you like. On the other hand, Zorro config space allows me to plug virtual cards. And I have already three of, the, uh, three of them. Uh, the first one is Zorro 2. It's the memory expansion, which is adding the native ARM memory to the, uh, to the Amiga at the full speed of this memory. Uh, it can be configurable up to eight megabytes. And on the other hand, I have also two Zorro 3 cards, which expose only ROM images. Um, which gives me a mechanism for a driver plug-in, uh, and it's also nicely using autoconfig mechanism. Uh, and what does it mean? Uh, it means since we expose all the hardware uh, hardware of the MO6 uh, for the Raspberry Pi to MO68, uh, we can write ha uh, hardware drivers for everything we would like to have. So what's currently in the work? is the micro SD card support. It's already working somehow. I have still some issues which have to be ironed out, but on the other hand, it's already working pretty nice. And what is also planned is the video driver using uh, video core 4 of Raspberry Pi. What is also poss possible, for example, is Wi-Fi driver or uh, I2C bus, if you like, uh, PWM, if you like, whatever you really need. Uh, how do I access it? Um, there is already device tree resource, which I will 
the scribe, which I will add auto -doc documentation soon, which exposed the device tree of Raspberry Pi to M68 side. Um, so the driver for, for micro SD, as you may see here, uh, this was the card I was using, 64 gigabytes, and it's recognized properly, it may be partitionized and so on, so it's already working. Um, how about the speed? Uh, yeah, um, the speed is pretty nice already. It's uh, more or less what I would expect to have, um, and it's shown here. So this is the close to final configuration of uh, MO68, and this is just Raspberry uh, 3D, it's not Raspberry 4. Um, and as you may see, the Amiga can perform up to more or less 800 MIPS in this configuration already. Um, so I would say it's a pretty nice value. And just imagine what will be possible, for example, with Firestorm 32 and uh, Compute Module 4 from, uh, from Raspberry family, which is much faster than what we have here in the case of Raspberry 3. Uh, yeah, right. So there is still a lot to do. So I have a lot of bugs in the code which have to be fixed. The FDU implementation have to be completed because right now I try to hide it from Amiga OS. The SD card driver needs some work in order to operate properly. I need to do more tests, uh, more optimizations are still possible. The Python 32 is around the corner, so uh, soon I will have something to do with it. Um, also, I'm planning to write some configuration or information software from Amiga OS about MO68, displaying, for, the, for example, the number of instructions executed, the speed, uh, and so on. Uh, right, so I'm uh, at the end of my presentation. I would like to thank you all for the financial, uh, financial support uh, through Patreon. Uh, Patreon. Um, these are the current and the past patrons. Uh, I'm sorry if I have forgot someone. I was trying to keep this list as uh, complete as possible. If you feel I have forget you, uh, I'm sorry for that. And uh, next time I will try to add you to the list. Um, and finally, if you like MO68, I'm happy if you could support further work. So uh, you have the project on the GitHub, it's open source. If you like it, use it, fork it, test it, start it, or just love it, or sponsor it if you like. If you also like to give me some fina financial support, you may find me off, uh, on Patreon, and I would be happy if you, if you could support, uh, support me. If you, if you cannot, I'm also happy. Uh, I just love this project. I love Amiga, so I'm really happy if you are using it and you, uh, if you are happy with it. All right. So I'm done. Thank you uh, for your time. Thank you for listening. And if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them right now or later. I mean, you know where to find me. Well, thank you, Michael. Yeah, let's see if there are any questions. Uh, just checking online here. Uh, we open it up on to Amiga World if people wanted to post questions there. We're also on IRC for questions and YouTube chat. Um, so I'm just checking those three. Are there any questions in the room? Uh, Jerry's got a mic. So we have a question coming from Alex Perez here. Yes, uh, hi. My question is um, simple. Uh, have you uh, thought about, um, I, I saw you had some other um, ARC64 um, chips that, uh, you know, this is minimal um, compatibility with. Um, is, uh, would RISC-V be a um, suitable um, uh, architecture to consider porting to, in your opinion? Um, it would be possible, yeah, um, but right now, as I said, the emulation or the translation process is very, very much handcrafted, which means uh, if you would like to support, for example, RISC-V, it would be have to written more or less from the scratch. But of course, it's possible. I mean, it's a, it's a very interesting architecture, which is just growing up and it's giving uh, with every year even more attention. So yeah, at some point, why not? Great. Thank you, Alex. Any other questions in the room here? Wow. Quite a bunch. I think the, their masks got their tongue. <laughs> um, I actually have a, a, a question. This, this might be uh, kind of silly, but with the virtual Zorro card, um, and, and I don't know if you, you can answer this, but do you think it'd be possible to build <coughs> some sort of adapter, maybe USB-based, where you could take a physical Zorro card 
and pipe it into a virtual machine that way? Oh, well, um, that could be maybe possible, but on the other hand, uh, I'm asking myself, uh, no, uh, I don't know. I, I don't really know. Sorry. Sorry. No, that's fair. That's fair. Maybe that's a question for the internet or someone to think about. Now, now I think the other question is why would you do this? There really is no reason, but hey, we're all here. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. But we, that's already gone. So just, uh, I think it'd be pretty wild if you had like a Pi 400 with like a little Zorro box with like a GVP SCSI card in there just for giggles. <laughs> so you're yeah. Do you have a well, question? So, well, not really a question, just a comment. The, one of the things that I first thought of when I saw this was the Bare Metal 64 project, which runs on a Pi, but it's an instant boot to a complete 64. So it seems like this is the, the, the foundation um, with the Bare Metal 68K processor to add the chipset around it and get a Bare Metal Amiga so that we're not booting into Linux and then booting into Amiberry and then so forth and so on. So I don't know if, if anyone's um, approached you and with that kind of an idea to expand upon this to, to go in that direction. Yeah, so um, what I would say from my side in this, uh, uh, that I was already asked what, what would be needed to boot, for example, an Amiga OS on this, uh, on MS68 without PyStorm. And if we would be able to add just few or a little bit of hardware support from, uh, for M68, it would be eventually very possible just to start a bigger OS on such a system. And on the other hand, as you said, bar metal M68, uh, this was the way I was trying to advertise this project on uh, Raspberry uh, forums, because I have just written there to people, if you like M68 assembly, and if you like uh, just playing with bar metal on Raspberry Pi, then you may right now already combine both of them and write in M68 assembly language uh, for Raspberry Pi and tinker with it. So it's, for me, it's pretty funny project because uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, you just may combine both of the very nice worlds together. Thank you. Any other questions? Hi. Um, first, I'd like to say I, I love this project. I, I think it's an awesome thing that you're doing for uh, 68K and the uh, Amiga community. Um, a quick question regarding the memory map. I mm -hmm. think I saw the ARM peripheral addresses were down in the 32-bit space. I imagine that's so that you can uh, create drivers inside of Amiga OS that communicate with ARM peripherals. Are yeah. there any challenges with uh, those addresses overlapping um, other Amiga reserved addresses? Uh, no, not really, because uh, I have put all the peripherals of ARM processor to the very, very top uh, part of the 4 gigabyte address space, which is defined by every single memory map of Amiga, which I have seen as reserved range. And this is far away or yeah, far away from any register, uh, registers which could, which could ex uh, exist on Amiga in any way. So I guess it's pretty safe. And on the other hand, since, uh, since this all uh, is described by device tree, in case of any conflict, I just can move them to the area which is not conflicting. So I wouldn't see that as an issue. Another question. Hi, my name is Chris. Um, most modern JITs uh, will kind of profile uh, on, at, at execution time and may pull out and recompile um, if you know things like branch. If, yeah. Uh, so, d have you have you uh, thought about how you would incorporate such methods in your system? Um, not yet. There was one point which, uh, where I was uh, thinking about that, it, and it was. Uh, branch prediction, uh, just to consider which branch is taken and which is not. Instead of that, I have simplified the process right now. So right now I'm considering the branch backwards within a short range as always taken and uh, the branch in the wide ranges are considered as not taken on default. But yeah, and so at, at some point in the future, it would be nice to add some profi uh, profiling information. So 
I, I have the possibility since I generate the code from the ARM, it would just be possible to notify or add some information to every translated block about which jumps were taken, which were not, and so on. But I was not really working on that so far. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, one more comment. I love the logo with Emu on it. So, I mean, you're already ready to go to market with that. That's beautiful. <laughs> Thanks. Okay. Um, I think it's time to bring Jens in. I need to do a little digital wi wizardry on my end. It's going to take about two minutes uh, to log into the, the next streaming type. So, Michael, thank you very much for what you've done today. Uh, excellent project. Really looking forward to following um, how things work out here in the near future. So, thank you, sir. Thanks. Thank you.